Well, good Thursday. We're glad that you're with us today on All Things Apostolic. And if you're uh, listening to this later than Thursday, we're still glad that you're with us. But this is a, a great day. And we have been talking about the rapture. And we've also been talking about some of the things that have been happening in revival and some good churches and things that are coming along. And last Sunday afternoon, um, I preached in Red Bluff, California for... Uh, Pastor Nathan Cox and his wife Allison and their children Madeline and Noah, uh, great precautious young children. And, uh, uh, and what a great work is going on there. That Sunday afternoon we baptized a new lady. Uh, they did and I was there with them and celebrated it. Uh, and they had just baptized two other adults uh, in the last week. And so God's moving in a great way. And I had preached there uh, uh, maybe a year ago. Uh, and the difference was uh, significant. The growth, uh, the maturity of the congregation was just exciting. They're looking for a building. And, um, and they've had some, uh, some other groups in town that have tried to suppress them. Uh, but I just, uh, and I met, we, he and I talked about this, that uh, that's just a sign. That's a sign that the devil knows and the forces of spiritual darkness that have held that city up until this time in their dominance, they know that there's a break coming unless they can suppress and discourage the man of God. Well, in Jesus' name, that's not going to happen. And so so this this is breaking, and it's going to be it's going to be great. So we're going to stand by to tell you more revival news in the future from Red Bluff, California. It is it is going, and we're excited. You know, and the thing is, is sometimes people are so uh, they people give up. That church has been there a long time. I can remember many years ago when that building was actually built by Pastor Lee Muncy, uh, a dear friend and elder in my life when I was very young. Uh, and, um, and it's been there, it's been through numerous pastors, it's had some very difficult times, some, some just really challenging times, and it's never really, really got on its feet. Well, well, there was a group that was going to sell the building and give it up. This is just a good little lesson for all of us. They were gonna sell it and give it up. And, um, and Pastor Sam Howard called Pastor Miles Young and said, I just feel like the Lord spoke to me, and, and said, um, would you be interested in, in taking uh, ownership of the responsibility for this building that we don't lose it and that there can be a, a, a viable church here? And so they talked, they agreed. Pastor Miles Young took the building. Uh, we all worked together a little bit to, to get it through some of those hard times. Uh, and uh, anyway, through a whole uh, bunch of events, uh, 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 Pastor Jesse Galindi, Galindo was there for a while and helped to stabilize things and get things on the ground and get bills paid and did a great job for the, for the period of time that he was there. And then Brother Cox came and now it is rolling. So, you know, it's kind of that old story, never give up, never, never think, never say never, and never say I give up. There, there is hope. Uh, and you got to have a little grit. <laughs> You got to say that you know we're not just caving in because things don't look good. We're going to stand up and get what we want here. So anyway, great report. Um, so uh, Monday, Tuesday, and yesterday we talked about the rapture, the rapture of the church. Then we also talked about the day of the Lord yesterday. That what is the day of the Lord? And we went through all that. Listen to it. I don't want to repeat it all today. You, it, it's all there from yesterday. But the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, transpires immediately after the church is taken out of the world. Now get this, the day of the Lord is called the 70th week of Daniel. So if we went back to Daniel and read the book of Daniel, we would see in chapter 9 that there's 70 weeks determined upon thy people. God's talking to Daniel. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, which is the nation of Israel. And those 70 weeks, if you calculate it out, you can actually see because it says until, until the time the Messiah comes is so long, it's 69 weeks. Then there's a period of time that is not the 69th and it's not the 70th. It's, a, it's like a parenthesis of time between those two. And then the 70th week comes, which is the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. 
So what occurs in that period of time between the 69th week when the Messiah actually comes into the city and is rejected and the 70th week, which has not yet occurred? So during that period of time, what transpires? What, what takes place? Well, so I want to talk about that just a little bit. That's what we call the church age. But why, why, do, we, why do we identify it that way? How, how do we know that? Well, we know that because the Bible says in Romans eleven twenty five 25, that presently blindness in part has taken place on Israel. Israel, when Jesus came, you will remember the nation of Israel, they rejected Jesus. He was the Messiah, but they rejected him. When they rejected him, you remember that Jesus uh, in the very last days before he is translated into heaven, he is weeping and sitting on a hill at night above the mountain in uh, looking down on Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks, but ye would not. And now desolation is determined upon you. And so these desolations are determined upon them for this period of time. And if you look at their history, it has been very much desolations in the most gritty and gruesome sense of the words. Everything that has transpired has been a terrible period of time of desolation. The 70th week comes, and during all of this previous history of Israel, they have not been faithful to their God. Just read their prophets in the Old Testament. They were not faithful to their God. There's king after king after king that followed the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was an idolater and a deep idolater and and so, uh, and both of, in, in both northern Israel, which is where the ten tribes were, and southern Israel, where the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin were, they they were not they were not uh, faithful to God. Once in a while, someone would come and there would be revival, but uh, in the overall picture, it was not good. And they went into apostasy. Then they rejected the coming of the Messiah with the birth of Jesus and his ministry. They rejected that and they crucified the Messiah. Paul tells us that's true. And, and, and Peter talks about you have murdered the Messiah, the one that came to save you in Acts chapter two when he's preaching on the day that the, Pente that the church started, the day of Pentecost. All of that lets us know that there is this period of time that God turned away from Israel and that God is presently taking out a people um, for his name's sake. So uh, let me just look up a scripture real, clear, real quick that tells us this very clearly. It's in Acts chapter 15 and in verse 14. This is, this is James talking. So what's happening here, let's slow down a little bit and talk about this. In Acts chapter 15, the disciples, the apostles are confused because all these Gentiles are coming in and getting the Holy Ghost and they thought it was just supposed to be for the Jews. Because the Old Testament testified, many, many scriptures testified that the Spirit would come upon the Jewish nation. And so they see these Gentiles, so, and they see the ministry of Paul, which is bringing in Gentiles all over the place. So they're not, there are some people who are saying it's not real, it's not of God, it's not right. But the, but the apostles were not saying that. They recognized that the real Holy Ghost was falling, but they were still puzzled, and they knew they had to work this out. So they had a general council meeting uh, in Acts 15. You can read about it there. And they're talking about this, and they're having Peter testify of the new people that are actually Gentiles that have came in under his ministry. And they're, having, they're, they're, they're talking about what happened with Paul and, and, and these people that are coming in. Well, James is the moderator of this meeting, the Apostle James. And the Apostle James comes to a conclusion when they have got through talking about it. And in verse 14, this is what his conclusion was. This is James actually talking. And he says, Simeon, talking about Simon Peter, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. So here he is. He's now at the first of this period of time when they have been rejected, God is now visiting the Gentiles. Simon Peter just talked about that, the people that got the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10 and Cornelius and his family and these other things that are taking place where Gentiles are receiving the Holy Ghost just like the Jews are receiving the Holy Ghost. They're trying to figure this out. And he said, Simon hath declared how God has now chosen to take out Gentiles, take out of them a people for his name. Okay, so these people 
are people taken out for the name of the Lord. And to this agree, now to validate what he's saying, he goes to the Old Testament and he goes to Amos and he says, although it doesn't say Amos here, it is in Amos. He says, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. So he's taking out a people for his namesake. And then he says, after this, I will return again and rebuild the tabernacle of David. Okay, so what is the tabernacle of David? So after he has taken out of the people, uh, uh, the Gentiles, for his namesake, which started on the day of Pentecost, and then it was Acts chapter 8 where it's Samaritans, and then it's Acts chapter 10 where it's Cornelius, which was the witness that Peter brought to this meeting that we're talking about in Acts 15. He said that this is what happened, and he got the Holy Ghost, and his family got the Holy Ghost, and, and they are saying, okay, well, we got to figure this out. And so, so James comes to the conclusion by looking in the Old Testament and by taking the witness of the apostle Peter and he says, okay, he is taking out a people for his name's sake. After this, after he takes out a people for his name's sake, he will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David. So, so the church age has a start point at the day of Pentecost and an end date when he is through taking out a people for his namesake, this select people called the church. It's not Israel. It's not a replacement for Israel. It is a people for his namesake. It starts with the falling of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. It ends with the Holy Ghost in those people, snatching them out. That's the Greek, snatching them out. That's the, that's the rapture. Rapture is the Latin, snatching them out. Uh, catching them away, that's the English, catching them away. So this time of the Gentiles starts with them receiving the Holy Ghost here at Acts 2 and then being snatched away or, or being taken out over here. Then after that takes place, this is James. This isn't Brother Wilson. <laughs> this is James. He says, after that, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. And so why did he say the tabernacle of David instead of the tabernacle of Moses? Because the tabernacle of David had actually the tabernacle of David replaced the tabernacle of Moses in the Old Testament. The tabernacle of Moses was identified with somberness. It was identified with death, killing all the all of the sacrifices. Um, it didn't. It was not identified with music. It was not identified with joy. It was not identified with dancing. It was not identified with celebration, which all of those things were part of the tabernacle of David. This is actually a prophetically precursor to the Pentecostal experience coming through the tabernacle of David's total fulfillment in this period of time when the spirit is going to fall on the Jews. This is the church is gone, has nothing to do with the church and all of those old Testament promises of the spirit coming that was going to come upon the Jews, that those of that day, they're going to, the antichrist is going to be revealed. These people are going to uh, be appalled and they're going to be under deep persecution and stress. Uh, all of these things taking place during that time, it's going. They're going to recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. That they've missed it. They've missed it. They're going to turn to Him. They're going to repent of their sins, and He is going to forgive them. Those that are alive in that day will repent for the national failure of Israel, and He will turn back to them. And there will be there will be thousands of them saved filled with the spirit that God promised to them in the Old Testament. All of those Old Testament promises about the coming of the Holy Ghost were first to the Jews. So we already know with a hermeneutical rule of historical uh, and grammatical and literal interpretation that any later fulfillment of a scripture in some other way than its original way never negates the original way. The original way that scripture was given, the original people it was given to, is never negated by the fact that, like in this case, the church receives the Holy Ghost, which was promised to Israel because God is taking out a people of the Gentiles for his namesake because they forsook him. And so, uh, and so after the church age, God will turn back to Israel and they will receive what God promised to them. Those are promises that God gave that are never negated. And they will 
they will they will be saved. The 144,000 will be saved. The 144,000 will become evangelists to the entire world. They're already everywhere in the world. It's not like the church where we have to send missionaries. They're everywhere in the world, and they own all the banks, <laughs> and they and they have the money, and they know the languages, and they are enculturated in those cultures. All of that stuff. There's no learning for them. They just they're already there. And they will be the evangels, and there will be people that believe them. And it's a great throng. It's a great throng. How do I know that? Because Revelation chapter 7 tells us about that great throng. And when someone asks, who are these people? It is very clearly stated, these are they that come out of great tribulation. And so they come out there. But all of that, all of that has uh, uh, nothing to do uh, with the church. The church is already raptured when that takes place. Now, uh, the reason I go through all of that is there are people that do not believe that God will ever turn back to Israel. They do not believe that. Well, there's there, time doesn't permit us to go into the scores, many, many, many of Old Testament scriptures where God made promises to Israel that are promises that uh, he said would be fulfilled that have not yet been fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled. God doesn't lie. Well, there are people that say because they have not been fulfilled, there are people that say, well, all of those promises, trans the church replaces them or the church fulfills that, to use a softer word that makes it more palatable. Uh, but the church, the church replaces Israel and becomes, uh, and they use the phrase that, that is used in the Bible, the Israel of God. And they say, now this is the Israel of God, and there, there will be no future renewal of Israel. Well, well, that's problematic because it doesn't square with Scripture. For example, let me just read three here, Romans in chapter 11, three Scriptures. First, let me just tell you that the whole chapter 11 of Romans is talking about has God cast away his people Israel? And when he says, that's the question, that's the first question of, of the chapter, hath uh, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And, and Paul's unequivocal answer is, God forbid. And that he's talking about Israel, we know, because he says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. So we know that he's talking about the fact that God has not permanently cast away his people, Israel. And he talks about it throughout this entire chapter. That is the subject. When you get to chapter uh, 2, verse 12, he talks about the fact that in verse 11 that they have stumbled. And so the fact that they've stumbled, does that mean that they will fall? In other words, we'll never be able to get back up. And he says, God forbid. He said, but rather through their fall, through their rejection of the Messiah, salvation has come to the Gentile. That's us in the church for to provoke them to jealousy. So in God's mind, he's going to give it to us and we receive it. We don't have the covenants. We don't have all the stuff, the promises. We don't have all the stuff that was given to Israel, but we receive it anyway. We take it anyway. And so he says that's used to provoke the Jews to jealousy that the Gentiles got it. But it, then he says this, notice this in eleven twelve of Romans. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, in other words, the world has received the promises of blessing of the Holy Spirit that they missed. And if the diminishing of them means the riches of the Gentiles, they're diminished, we have received the promises of God as Gentiles. Then he makes this question, how much more their fullness? If the diminishing has brought promises and blessing to Gentiles, how much more is that going to bring to the world when they embrace the promises. Now, he doesn't just say this once. He says this again. He says in verse 14, if any, uh, he says, um, verse 15, for if the casting away of them, if the casting away of them, they are cast away in the present. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, then what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? So when they fulfill, it's going to bring to the world a, a, a full-orbed 
movement that leads to the coming of Jesus Christ himself to reestablish the kingdom, which, which is an ending that is much grander than the rapture of the church. Now, it's not much grander for us because we're in the rapture of the church, but the rapture of the church does not bring the end of the age when there is this explosion of, of beauty and power with the, with the revelation of Jesus Christ in his second coming. And so that's going to come when, through the fact that they have received the promises of God and will usher him back and will welcome him back and will be repentant for what they did. So uh, then he, he warns us. He says, you are the wild branch grafted in. Those people are the original branch. So if they're regrafted into the promises that I've given to them, how much more should you be sober about your salvation because you are grafted in? And then he kind of makes a, a, a statement here that I don't know how anybody could avoid. In, uh, in verse number 25, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye, lest ye be wise in your own conceits. Notice this. That blindness in part is happened to Israel. Blindness in part, not total blindness. They're not totally wiped out. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles be come in. That's pretty clear. I don't, I don't know what you're going to do with that if you don't want to accept that. But, but blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then in verse 26, he says, and so shall all Israel be saved. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them which I shall take away their sins. And then he goes ahead and says, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So God made those promises and God called them and God's going to see that it all comes to pass. But that is not meaning that the church will be here during that time of judgment on Israel. We will be snatched, according to the Greek. We will be raptured, <clears throat> according to the Latin. We will be caught away according to the English, take your pick, but they all mean the same thing. And that's why Paul said, comfort you one another with these words.